So it's, this is actually, I think, uh, a, a very good uh, moment to have a conversation about the Arab revolutions because we're, we're no longer in the Arab Spring. We're, we're in the Arab Autumn. Uh, we are the, the lyrical days of the, of the Arab revolutions when everything seemed possible are over and, and we've entered a time of uncertainty when our image of the Arab revolutions is framed not only by the images of jubilant uh, protesters in, in Tunis and in Tahrir Square, but by sectarian tension, mob violence, church bur burnings, humanitarian intervention, so to speak, in Libya and a regional struggle uh, for hegemony involving Iran, Turkey, the United States, Israel, it's a much more complicated picture. So the, the revolutionary wave has really um, only begun. Uh, I'm reminded of a, a wonderful scene in the Battle of Algiers, a, a Ponte Corvo's great film, which many of you have seen, I'm, su I'm sure, where an Algerian revolutionary uh, is talking to a young recruit about the revolution. He says, the, the easy part is, is, is the revolution. Making the revolution is the easy part. The hard part comes the day after. The Middle East and North Africa are now in a period of extraordinary ferment and flux. And, and so it's difficult to say anything with certainty about these uprisings. But there is one thing which I think can be said with certainty, which is that they took everyone by surprise. It's true that they now look almost inevitable. And when you stir together political repression, economic stagnation, in the case of Egypt, anger over foreign policy, and a, and a, and a very deep sense of, of humiliation, you have a very potent revolutionary cocktail. But the fact is no one saw this coming. Why is that? I, I think that's worth pondering. Uh, in the West, much of the literature on the Arab and Muslim world told us that people in the region either weren't ready for democracy or they simply didn't want it. The pundits who passed for experts in the American press said the same thing. The Arabs don't like their regimes, but they're too tired to confront them. And in any case, political freedom isn't valued in the Arab world. I and mean, how many times were we told by Bernard Lewis or by pundits quoting Bernard Lewis that the opposite of tyranny in, the, in, in, Ar in Arabic isn't freedom, it's justice. Now, as a result, there wasn't a great deal of pressure uh, for reform in the region. Now, did, did the Orientalists who were making this argument actually believe this? Uh, I think they partly did. The, the region uh, did appear incredibly stagnant, particularly its political systems. Arab governments had shown remarkable ingenuity in buying off discontent, either through patronage uh, or oil rents, and when that didn't work, there was always the torture cell. And Western patrons rarely complained. In fact, uh, the Americans uh, and the British often called on their friends for help. American and British agents were frequent visitors to interrogations in Yemen and Egypt, and as we're now learning in Libya. But skepticism about the Arab world, about reform in the Arab world, was coupled with anxiety about what might happen if reform did occur. Not to the people in the region, but to our interests. If these countries democratized, we'd be in trouble. The Arabs might get ideas about oil. They might get ideas about Israel. This is why the so-called Bush Freedom Agenda collapsed very quickly after the success of the Muslim Brothers in the 2005 parliamentary elections in Egypt after the 2006 victory of Hamas in what were free elections in Palestine. Right now, uh, we have Elliot Abrams, among others, trying to claim credit for the Arab Spring, but let's face it, this wave is occurring in spite of America, not because of it. And the US knows this no matter how many sorties it sent to Libya. Just ask the people of Bahrain. I don't want to suggest that people in the region saw this coming, because they didn't. I was in Egypt about a year before the uh, revolution and spoke with Assam al Aryan, who's a prominent leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. I asked him why, with all their reasons for anger, 
Egyptians hadn't revolted in greater numbers against a regime they so clearly despised. And his response was, we're a pharaonic people, don't expect us to revolt. It could have been said by any Western Orientalist. That cliche has gone up in smoke, along with so many others, in Takbir Square. Another cliche that's fallen is that the Arabs don't care about Palestine, that it's just a distraction, a tool by which uh, elites in the region manipulate public opinion and distract them from problems at home. It's a real concern. Now we're contending with a whole series of other cliches about these Arab revolutions, that they're Facebook revolutions, they're post-Islamist revolutions, they're a counter-jihad, glib formulations which tell us much more about those who make them than about the revolutions, which are extraordinarily complex. The image that, 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 that comes to mind for me is a prison cell that is opened. We have a thousand, let's say you have a thousand prisoners in, in it. The door, sudden, the, the door suddenly open. What happens? The prisoners go in a lot of different directions. And I think that's what we're seeing now. So these revolutions are complex, fluid affairs, and um, it's time to sort of appraise them and cut through some of the cliches that have arisen. And we have four very distinguished speakers who will offer their reflections on the Arab world the rev in ferment and tumult. And our first speaker is Hisham Matar. Hisham is a Libyan-British novelist who was born in New York and raised mostly in Cairo. His father, a Libyan dissident, was abducted from the family's home in Cairo in 1990 with the assistance of Mubarak's police, and he's been missing ever since. Hisham is the author of two novels, In the Country of Men, and most recently, Anatomy of a Disappearance. He's currently a visiting professor at Barnard. We'll begin with Hisham. Hello, good morning. Um, thank you, Adam, and um, thanks to everybody here for, for being here, and also to the Brooklyn uh, festival for hosting this event. I think um, the Arab Spring, one of the, which is actually in, in Arabic, it, we refer to it as the Arab Awakening, which I think is far less seasonal. And uh, um, I think every time we speak about it, we speak in such, uh, or not every time, but a lot of the times when we speak about it, we speak as if um, we expect history uh, to respond uh, at the same pace as it did during these uprisings. History which moves at a, most of the time at a glacial pace. Um, suddenly there are moments such as the, the Arab Spring when it's um, very fast and dramatic. And somehow we expect that to continue and I think we have to, we have to first of all, before asking what is going to happen, perhaps ask ourselves or question the assumptions that we have uh, created around what has actually taken place. Um, I think one of the things that has taken place is that it's not been the thing that people have been focusing on, which is you know uh, the overthrow of incredibly violent, long-standing dictators, uh, which is obviously a fundamental event, an incredible event. Um, but I think what is more fundamental and what is more dramatic is that a people have for the first time collectively, or at least the first time in their living memory, collectively stopped and asked themselves such fundamental questions about what it means to be a people, what it means to be a society. And for, for, a, for, for a moment glimpsed a different possibility. Um, and even though now there is this time of uncertainty, um, I think that, for me, it's actually a welcome thing, uncertainty, because it's a sign of maturity not to know what's going to happen next, um, particularly for us, because we have always known what is going to happen next. We have always known what is expected of us. I speak as a Libyan, for example. I've, I've always known what the dictatorship wants me to think, what the dictatorship wants me to say, what food it would like me to eat, what books it would like me to read. Uh, how it would like me to behave and suddenly none of us know and it's very exciting <laughs> it's an incredibly exciting moment so um, as appropriate as it is for us to be anxious about what's going to happen next I think it's also uh, 
deeply appropriate to celebrate this moment of, of, of uncertainty.